Good morning. I'd like to welcome you back to our session on shallow and deep geothermal systems, characterization, integration, stimulation, simulation, and induced seismicity, uh, apparently with video on demand, although I'm not entirely sure what that means. I'm the, the chair, co-chair of the session this morning with uh, Suhail Ezzedin. Suhail is off presenting a poster right now. Um, I'd like to introduce the, our first talk of, the, of this session. Um, it's by Tai Eto. It's seismostatistical characterization of micro seismicity observed at geothermal fields. I am Tayeto from Tohoku University, Japan. I am talking about seismostatistical uh, approach for risk evaluation of large induced seismicity from geothermal reservoirs. Occurrence of felt earthquakes in subsurface development, including geothermal development, has been reported worldwide, and it is recognized as one of the most critical environmental burdens in subsurface development. Uh, technologies to establish risk assessment of felt induced earthquakes and to control uh, magnitudes of induced seismicity have been required, and there are two approaches to realize them. Uh, one is geomechanical modeling of felt earthquakes observed on, uh, based on observations and uh, theories of seismologies. In this method, precise analysis of uh, collected events uh, have been done in order to interpret physics uh, behind occurrence of felt earthquakes. The other approach is stochastic, mod stochastic modeling, uh, where <coughs> statistical model of uh, induced seismicity uh, is identified and is used to evaluate probability of occurrence of felt earthquakes. In seismostatistical modeling, Typically, information of origin time, half center, and magnitude of earthquakes are used to uh, identify a model. Because we do not need scientists to precisely analyze each event on site, seismostatistical modeling uh, would have higher applicability to near real operating fields, and site independent applicability can be also expected by automatic identification of the model using collected events. So in this study, we have applied the ETAS model, which is one of the standard stochastic, stochastic models in seismology, to induced and seminatural earthquakes from geothermal reservoirs as a first step to investigate feasibility to statistically predict occurrence of induced seismicity. The ETAS model is one of the point process models and expressed by this equation. The original idea of the ETAS model has been published by Ogata in 1988. Uh, we can estimate current occurrence rate of earthquakes from information of origin time and the magnitude of past earthquakes. The second term of the equation represents occurrence rate of earthquakes, which follow modified Omori formula describing aftershock activities of each earthquake. The first term mu represents occurrence rate of earthquakes which do not obey modified Omori formula. At natural earthquakes, these events are considered as background independent seismicity. On the other hand, these events are considered as primary fluid signals, which has been interpreted as events induced by fluid injection in the research area of induced seismicity. Uh, we analyzed the micro seismic event observed at two geothermal fields. One is Yanaizu Nishiyama, which is one of the largest hydrothermal fields in Japan. And in this field, there are pre-existing seismic activity before exploration phase. And four field earthquakes occurred during production operation since 1996. Uh, most of the geothermal liquids 
after power generation is injected into injection injection zone, uh, penetrated to into the production zone. The other field is Basel EGS site in Switzerland, where no earthquakes had been observed for several hundred years, but some felt earthquakes occurred during and after hydraulic stimulation. This figure shows the result of identification of ETAS model. The upper one is Yanai's Nishiyama, and bottom one is Basel. The horizontal axis is elapsed to time, and these are cumulative number of earthquakes and time series of magnitudes. Blue shows observed data, and red shows identified ETAS model. At Yanai's Nishiyama, the ident identified ETAS model is reasonably consistent with observed data. On the other hand, at the Basel, identified ETAS model is very inconsistent with observed data, suggesting that the nature of induced seismicity at Basel is significantly different from that of natural earthquakes, for which the ETAS model has been established. Uh, However, we were able to model the micro seismic activity at Basel when we use moving short windows. Uh, we have calculated the time change of occurrence rate of primary fluid signals, uh, which are considered to be related to water injection. Uh, this figure shows the result of Yanai's Nishiyama data. The horizontal axis is elapsed time, and the top one is reinjection rate to the production zone, and the bottom one is occurrence rate of primary fluid signals. This figure shows that in the period of high reinjection rate to the production zone, higher occurrence rate of primary fluid signals is observed, but no clear correlation between the occurrence rate of primary fluid signals and the production rate of geothermal liquids was found. Uh, this figure shows the uh, pipe center distribution and the trajectories of boreholes at Yanai Junishiyama. Uh, and the uh, trajectory of the treatment injection well is shown in red line. And the largest felt earthquake occurred near the injection point. We separated the uh, events at Yanai Junishiyama based on distance from the injection point, uh, as shown in this figure in order to see the relationship between rejection and occurrence of primary fluid signals. Uh, this sphere is the boundary surface of the two groups. As a result, at near field from reinjection point, in the period of high reinjection rate to the production zone, the occurrence rate of primary fluid signals is higher. On the other hand, at the far field from reinjection point, no clear correlation between the occurrence rate of primary fluid signals and the reinjection rate was found. We therefore concluded that uh, most of the events at Yanai Nishiyama can be interpreted as natural earthquakes, but the events near the uh, treatment injection point have more induced nature. Uh, we also have calculated the primary fluid signal rate at Basel. As a result, in the period of, of high injection rate to the production zone, the occurrence rate of primary fluid signals is higher, as it is for Yanai's Nishiyama. In this study, we have applied the ETAS model to induced and semi-natural seismicity from Josama Reservoir. As a result, the the ETAS model was uh, success, successfully identified for the data from hydrothermal field uh, with background seismicity, but not for the data from EGS reservoir. Uh, we also found that one of the parameters of the ETAS model, uh, considered, to be human, considered to be related to human operation, showed clear correlation to injection to the reservoir. From these results, it can be said that stochastic model of seismicity from reservoirs would have a potential to evaluate risks of large earthquakes associated with human operation to the reservoir. 
We have revealed the, some significant natures of induced seismicity and planning to incorporate them into se seismostatistical model. I show one example. This figure shows the occurrence time of microseismic multi-pet clusters. This result shows that uh, after increasing of injection rate, a number of new multi-pet clusters initiated. Such responses of induced seismicity to human operation to the reservoir will be statistically modeled in our future study. That's all I prepared for my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Do we have any questions? So I have a question. In developing your, your stochastic approach, how, um, how much data do you need to help evaluate induced seismicity, at, for example, at uh, a location where you're injecting water? Uh, number of events. How many events do you need? Uh, oh. uh, at least 100 events. At least 100 events. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tayeb Ayatoli Tafti, talking about time lapse stress and rock property profiling using micro seismic data, a case study at the Northwest Geysers. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about the time lapse stress and rock property profiling using the microseismic data. And this is the work that we have done in the Center for Geothermal Studies at US University of Southern California. So through my talk, I'm going to first about the introduction and what is the goal of this project and why we do such a project in USC. And also then I talk about the velocity modeling then I'm talking about the framework that we need to interpret the result of the velocity modeling. And also, and then finally, I talk about the integrated inter uh, interpretation and also the concluding remarks that we uh, have studied in the geysers. So as you can uh, see, this is, the, for example, the enhanced geothermal system in, uh, or the geothermal field. When we have injected fluid, this injection of the fluid uh, through the thermal uh, contraction or the changing the pore pressure, which is... Uh, like the cause of the, some uh, stress change and pore pressure in, the, in this area, they cause some seismic slippage and decrease the stability of the rocks. And these are uh, after some flaws and also some uh, fractures or natural fractures over there. They create the fractures over here. And these create the fractures because of the slippage. We see some uh, uh, seismic wave that has been uh, so we detect some seismic, seismic waves from uh, this kind of creation of the fractures, and it does like a, a small, like an earthquake, that we can detect them as a microseismic data. But it is important for us, most of the studies that we have seen in microseismic data, mostly they use the location to characterize this kind of uh, um, um, events. But we can, we have a powerful tool like tomographic inversion to invert this uh, travel path through the, um, uh, or fracture medium to these sensors and in using some uh, tomographing inversion uh, method to invert them to calculate the velocity models, both the compressional and also shear wave velocities. But it is also important when we have such a, a shear wave velocities uh, or compression velocity models, they are not uh, high resolution. They are mostly low resolution data in some, uh, you see the, some grid, uh, some points uh, at the space. So what we can do, because we have lots of hard point data here, the geostatistical approach is mainly applicable here. We uh, fit, the, fit the ordinary, fit the 
Gaussian variegram to this data, and after uh, fitting the, uh, the Gaussian variegram to this data, we can use the ordinary Krieging or other uh, or simulation or other techniques to find the enhanced uh, resolution or the, and to better avoid a smooth uh, velocity models. And using these smooth velocity models, we can come back to the petrophysical science when they have the sonic logs or when they have other logs. They use some equations to calculate the rock properties and also the stress through, through, the, through the medium. And it also it is important here, when we have both compressional and shear wave velocity, we can calculate lots of uh, different properties of the reservoir like Poisson ratio, shear modulus, or the young modulus or bulk modulus and extensional stress and hydric stress. But the, the only key point that is missing here is the density. And because at the geysers we have some lithology logs, we can somehow estimate also the density through the reservoir. So we use also the density to some uh, at the well logs and then we estimate the density through the whole reservoir using the geostatical approach and integrated those uh, density and the velocity information together to calculate the stress and rock properties of the reservoir. And it is interesting that the result that we, can, we get at the geyser, it is so um, magnificent, and we can see how the result can uh, help us to characterize the fracture network at the geysers. So, but before going to those velocity models, we need to know what is the effect of velocity, or what the effect of different features on the velocity modeling. And in the literature, you can see lots of different uh, features uh, affect the velocities. But what is important here, we come up with the uh, idea that closing of the small cracks, uh, due to pressure with depths or increase the overburden pressure or cementation can increase the seismic velocity. And also, the, for example, fracturing, it is a main cause of the reduction in velocities, chemical alteration, extreme, extreme, extreme uh, temperature gradient, or other things, can, uh, and porosity can decrease the uh, velocity. And also, but in uh, this kind of reservoir, we also use some log data to find out what is the actual uh, effect of the fractures here. So you can see in, in the rock data, you see if the, we have the dry and saturated rock, the, uh, the, uh, the saturated is blue and dry is, uh, dry is the red one. So if we use that one, we can see there is no uh, uh, change in the uh, um, compressional velocity and a little bit change in the uh, decrease of the velocity in the shear wave velocity. So we can use that if we see the, de see the re uh, reduction of the velocity, uh, compression velocity in the, in the geysers, they are not because of the saturation or because of the injection water. They are because of the fractures that are happening over there. And also you can see that uh, in, in different uh, type of the rocks that we have at the geysers, we can see the depression of uh, the reduction of the velocity through the prosody. And this prosody is mainly because of fractures. There is no other kind of prosody that we have at the geysers. And also the other thing that is important important here, uh, when we have such a, a stress regime uh, at, the, at the fractures, the normal stress that confine the pressure together, if the normal stress reduced, it means that we have some open fractures area, and the reduction of the normal stress it is an indicator of the open fractures. Another framework that we need to interpret the data is the modulus. And it is interesting that we, if we sub, uh, this is uh, some uh, core data that we uh, and laboratory measurement of the core data, you can see the in the uh, dry and saturated um, um, uh, rocks. So you can see the, the saturation raise the raise the bulk modulus and also they reduce the shear modulus. So if we re see the reduction in both the shear modulus and the bulk modulus, it means that there is a fractures over there because most of the modulus decrease with the fracture density or the void uh, ratio. And also, if we see the reduction in the bulk modulus uh, and uh, a reduction in bulk modulus and of course the increase in the shear modulus, it, see, it gives us another phenomenon that I'm talking about, about that later. This is the first result. This is the, uh, the this, this figure at the right. You can see this is the northwest geysers. And we peak the horizon at the normal temperature reservoir that we have lots of seismicity and we have lots of accuracy of the seismic velocity models. And also, I think it's interesting, at this kind of this reservoir, we have about uh, the gray rock, uh, rock, which has a, a constant density. So we can uh, come, uh, get accurate of also density as well. And this normal temperature reservoir, mostly gray rock, you can see how the, dense, how the, uh, uh, how the uh, compressional velocity change through the whole horizon 
at these depths. And it is interesting that when, when we see the, when these are the reduction in the uh, compression velocity, you can see the white and the black circles. The black circles mean the, in, uh, the amount of the injection they have at the geysers, and the white circle are the amount of the production they have over there. So you can see in the areas that we interpret as a, as a high, dense, high fracture density area, the production is higher with uh, considerable li little, less amount of the uh, uh, injection of the water. Also, you can see that they are really matched with the normal stress data that we see the open fractures over he, uh, all the way over here. Also, in a small area like this, you can see also the, some uh, reduction in both uh, v, uh, compression velocity and normal stress. So it means that we have all the way fractures over here. But we, we need to know what kind of, how, how these fractures propagate through the time and what is the result of that. Also, if you, this is a more in, 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 uh, interesting feature at the geysers that we, we compare the bulk modulus and the shear modulus. Do you remember that I told you that if you have a reduction in both modulus, we see that we, it is a fracture anomaly? So you can see there's lots of areas like this and this. We see the reduction in, uh, reduction in the both modulus. But in this area, if you look at further, we see the predominant loss of the bulk modulus, but we don't see the, we see the less uh, amount of the loss in the shear modulus. This uh, uh, come to our uh, attention that this is kind of flow that we call it a squid flow. And in a squid flow, when we have the micro pores, we see such a behavior. So it means that although there is a fractures over here, but this fracture is so tiny, and they cannot create the micro, uh, micro permeability. They are only micro permeability. So this is the interesting feature that we can see here. But another area that the geyser is over here, you can see we see the less amount of the bulk modulus reduction, but we see the prominent loss of the shear modulus. And it is it's said that these are the micro permeability or micro pores that we see over here and the fracture density is so high. Let's go through the time. Let's travel through the time to see what's happened to the fracture network through the time from 2005 to 2010. You can see in 2005, you see this is the uh, fracture, uh, high fracture area that we can see here. At 2000, uh, 2008, you can see the some uh, uh, propagation of the fracture through the uh, this area, and also propagation of fraction network through the middle of the reservoir. And to 2009, it is completely complete, completed. But it is interesting, in 2010, we see some separation of the fraction network together at this area over here. So we can be using this kind of application, we can see because of the injection and production, uh, continuous pro injection and production at the geysers, and if, for example, uh, stopping some injection, uh, starting some injection or production, we can see how the fraction network changed through the time. Also, the same features has been uh, shown, for example, in the, using the normal stress that we see the open fractures area. You see the closure of the, uh, closure of the uh, fractures in, the, in this area over here in 2010. But let's look at the bulk modulus and shear modulus. This is, you see that, the, again, we see the propagation of the uh, fracture, the, the fractures they become higher in 2008, as you can see, the loss of more reduction here. And also, in, uh, in the uh, shear modulus, we see the same result, and also the closure of the fracture uh, network over here. And it is interesting that the same area that we talk about, the squid flow over here, and also the the biot flow over here, there are the same features and the, 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 uh, the pores and the micro or micro pores cannot be changed over the time. So in the summary, uh, we, instead of using the location of the microseismic day events, we have used the time-lapse tomographic inversion to uh, characterize a fraction network and it is a really successful uh, um, approach to using the velocity models. And we all demonstrate that integrating the passive seismic tomography with density information and also production data can uh, detect some uh, space-time dependency of the stress and the select properties in response to local variation of the fluid pressure or the fracture creation at the geysers. And also, uh, we, um, the this time-lapse monitoring uh, uh, of the stress and rock property pollution show the importance of the considering the uh, seismic tomography uh, to, for estimating the fracture properties where we have sufficient uh, mock seismic present or where we have velocity models available. Uh, um, at the end, I would like to uh, thank uh, DOE for funding pro this project and our partner, uh, Lawrence Bacon National Lab and Calpine for supporting this project. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? 
Yes. The, the, the tomographic, the initial tomographic immersion has a six, uh, 600 meter by 600 meter block, each block. Uh, we have the data, but it will be re, uh, enhanced the resolution because 100 meter by 100 meter for each block. And we have about uh, 43,000 points. Excuse me, I cannot hear you. Yeah, it, it, there is, it, it, you know, for finding the, finding the, uh, the, um, the general distribution of the fraction network, it is enough. You know, we, we don't say, for example, these are the fractures over here. We talk about the fracture network over there. For example, it would be 100 meter by 100 meter, which we can talk about the general uh, fracture network, not the, for example, a specific location of the fractures, because the fracture is so small. Yes. We don't, we don't, we, I'm sorry, we, we don't do such a study, but me, me, it is interesting to do that. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yes. What is the question? Uh, can you speak up, please? Yes, the orientation uh, of the fractures is mostly uh, through, the, through the northwest. It is like the, we have over here. And they, they use some, or we, for the orientation, they should use the, uh, they, we have some studies by LKB that they do the uh, shear wave splitting to calculate the orientation, and it's northwest direction. But we cannot get the orientation from this kind of a study. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Our next presentation is an invited presentation uh, by Katie Boyle, The Stress State of the Northwest Geysers Geothermal Field and Implications for Fault-Controlled Fluid Flow. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm Katie Boyle. Um, I'm an engineering associate at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and this project was done um, at Stanford with Mark Zoback. Um, and we were looking at a, a very high quality data set from the Northwest Geysers uh, geothermal field. So the title of this talk is The Stress State of the Northwest Geysers Geothermal Field and the Implications for Fault Controlled Fluid Flow. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so uh, just a rough outline. Um, first, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to the tectonic setting of both the San Andreas Fault System, uh, with which I'm sure everyone here is familiar, and uh, the geysers field. Um, the method is, is pretty straightforward, and I think that uh, th this talk is really about a method that's pretty simple and a very easy way of using microseismic data to understand the stresses um, as long as you have enough of uh, microseismic data. So I'm just going to very briefly show some of the focal mechanisms that we got. Um, I'm going to explain the method for inverting for stress um, and also uh, how we decided on which of the two nodal planes from the focal mechanism was the most likely fault plane. And then I'll just uh, go over the result, results and show you uh, the stresses and the preferred fault plane orientations that we obtained for our study area. 
So this plot, um, we're looking at Northern California here. And um, in blue, you can see the name of, of three significant faults in the area. So SAF is, of course, the San Andreas Fault there along the coast. MF is the Macama Fault Zone. And GVF is the Green Valley Fault Zone. This plot is taken from a, a paper by Provost in Houston um, where they took microseismic data um, obtained focal mechanisms and used the focal mechanisms to invert for stress. Um, so each bar that you see on this plot is a uh, orientation of SH max obtained from the focal mechanism inversions. And in some areas, the microseismic data was pretty sparse. But in other areas, like the geysers here, shown in red, there's an abundance of data. So each of these little lines has a bin number associated with it. Bin 39 is the one that corresponds to the geysers. And what Provost and Houston found was a, a northeast SH, SH max orientation um, throughout the region. And it's very, very consistent. There is a little bit of northward rotation up here um, towards the Sutter Buttes. But generally, it's north-northeast in orientation. Um, this is a transpressional tectonic region, so the majority of the faulting um, along the San Andreas or in, in the coast ranges um, is a combination of strike slip and reverse faulting. Um, unfortunately, the stress inversion that was carried out in this grid block was done with uh, a limited number of data or a limited number of data points. So about 300 earthquakes were used to obtain um, the stress result, and uh, the misfit was pretty high at about 38%. Um, a study was done in 1986 by David Oppenheimer that focused just on stresses in the geysers. So the same method was used where earthquake, uh, double couple earthquake focal mechanisms were inverted to obtain the stress. So you can see the focal mechanisms that were used in this inversion. Uh, there were around 80 of them. And um, the results are shown in red and blue. So the red result is the shallow um, orientation of SH max obtained from these mechanisms. And it also corresponds roughly to the result that Provost and Houston obtained. The blue line is the deeper SH max orientation um, obtained by Oppenheimer. But both of these are, the, the basic idea is a north northeast um, orientation of SH max. Um, I'm, I'm calling these uh, mechanisms poorly constrained only because the network capabilities back then were so limited that there was a lot of uncertainty uh, in these mechanisms. But the findings were that the, the faulting regime was one of um, combined strike slip and normal faulting with some limited reverse faulting mechanisms showing up in the data. Um, and again, this SH max orientation is consistent with other SH max orientations obtained in the coast ranges and east of the San Andreas Fault. So this shows the catalog, um, the LBNL geysers catalog. So we have a, a monitoring array of about 30 stations. And at times, with our temporary arrays, it's been as much as you know 40 plus stations. Um, and what you're looking at is seismicity from the period of 2005 to 2011. So um, this is just a, a Google Earth plot here. North is up. Um, this is the, the seismicity basically traces out the dimensions of the steam field. Um, this red line down the center is the cross section shown down here. And I'll get to that in a second. And this yellow box here denotes our study area. So I should say that this yellow box actually contains about 65% of the seismicity in the field. So most of the seismicity is coming from the northwest portion of the field. It's a very, very high density injection and production area. This cross section here shows that basically as we move toward the northwest, the earthquakes are deeper than they are in the south. And you can see, again, way more earthquakes happening in the, the northwest section of the field than happening out here. So this is the area that we focused on for the focal mechanism study. Um, obviously, the top of the, the steam reservoir and the top of the fell site aren't straight lines. But I just wanted to give you an approximation of, of where the fractured Metagraywacki interval is right in here. And I just want you to notice that most of the seismicity is occurring below the fractured Graywacki interval. So zooming in on the, that yellow box, so now we're looking at the seismicity in the northwest geysers. We're again looking at seismicity um, that happened between 2005 and 2011, all ranges of magnitudes. And what I'm doing here is just showing a, a north-south cross section here in blue. 
and an east-west cross-section here in green, um, co-plotted with injection and production wells so that you can see that most of the seismicity, though it, it clusters generally around the base of the well, it's, it's well below the terminus of the well bore. Um, so in this plot and, and in these ones too, if you see a blue well, that's injection, a red well is production, and these yellow wells are very, very high volume injectors. Um, these green triangles here are recording stations, and that's just to give you an idea of our monitoring capability. Um, we have quite a few recording stations in our study area alone, and then throughout the entire field, there are even more stations. So we really do have a lot of, of uh, uh, monitoring capability. Um, so you can see that there are, are little swarms of earthquakes that kind of underlie these wells. Sometimes the swarms, you know, appear to, to kind of glom together. Um, but most of the uh, earthquakes are happening uh, down here, you know, well below the, the termination of the wells. So, um, oh, and there's one more thing. How do I go back? <laughs> here. Oh, one more thing um, is that there's this large region of diminished seismicity in the center here, and we're not really sure what that is, but it's just a, an interesting feature in plan view to note that there's less seismicity there, even though there are wells that are deviated into that area. Okay. So um, just to show you a few examples of, of focal mechanisms, these are standard beach ball diagrams showing focal mechanisms that we obtained in our study area. Generally speaking, the focal sphere coverage was, was very good, and that's what I'm showing with the, the green shading. Um, areas that are shaded in green are areas where we have uh, first motion observation. So sometimes we have uh, you know, an event like this that, that has limited focal sphere coverage, but for the most part, our mechanisms look like this. Generally speaking, we have pluses in the, the dark shaded areas and we have minuses in the lighter areas, but every now and then we will have a first motion that's not plotting in the focal sphere quadrant where it should, should be plotting. Um, and that's going to contribute to uncertainty in these mechanisms. So despite the high quality of the data, there is unfortunately still relatively high uncertainty in the nodal plane orientation, but we... we uh, included amplitude ratios in the inversion, which is something you're able to do with this inversion program hash. And we're also hoping that through using uh, tomography, TomoDD, we're going to be able to refine the locations, redo this study, and maybe we'll see some, some further um, reduction of our uncertainty. So this plot shows, of the events that we saw um, in the last map view, this shows the ones that were used in the focal mechanism inversion. And basically, I just want to communicate that we have accurately represented the spatial distribution of the seismicity in the study. It's not like we were only getting earthquakes from one section of the, the study and we're not you know, representing the entire area. These plots look very, very similar to the plots that we showed before. Um, we, we really did get a good sampling of the seismicity. Uh, these blue lines here are just to show, again, the approximate um, fractured Metagrawacki interval um, that we're calling the reservoir. Um, so again, most of the events are down here below the reservoir. Um, uh, the mean depth of these events is about 3.1 kilometers. Um, and this, this plot right here just shows the distribution of uh, hypocenters by depth. And so you can see, again, the peak of this distribution is down here below the reservoir, which is denoted by these dotted red lines here. Um, the majority of the mechanisms were A mechanisms, which basically means that the plane uncertainty was about 20 degrees, the nodal plane uncertainty. The mean misfit from this data set was 23%. So this is a, a significant improvement over the Provost and Houston result, which was about, again, a misfit of about 38%. So the inversion for stress, the, the one point I want to be taken from this uh, slide is, is uh, bullet point number two, which is that the tangential component of traction on a fault plane is parallel to the slip vector on, this, on that plane. This method has been used in several studies, so I'm not going to go into the details here. But what's interesting about this study, and this is building on the method of uh, Townen and Zoback, is that we did the inversion on a recursive grid. So what I mean by recursive grid is that we take a single grid block and we put all of the earthquakes inside that grid block and we divide it into eight and if each of those eight pieces contains 25 events, we carry out a stress inversion. If that 
that piece can be subdivided again into eight pieces. We carry out stress inversions in, in those. And we keep doing this until the very smallest grid block doesn't contain 25 events anymore. And so what you're looking at is a plan view of the recursive grid. Keep in mind that it's a three-dimensional grid. So you're looking down onto the study area, and you can see all sorts of different grid block sizes, some of the very smallest here, um, getting down to clusters that may even be associated with individual injection or production wells. What I'm going to use to show the results, however, is one level of gridding out of the grid. And the reason I'm going to do that is because when we looked at the recursive grid results, we found that when we took a grid block and its stress result and we subdivided it, the results that we got in smaller grid blocks were very similar, I mean almost identical to what we got in the larger grid block. So rather than showing every level of gridding, I've picked one level here. These grid blocks are about one by one and a half kilometers in dimension. And um, I'm just going to use these to describe the stress results that we obtained. So what you're looking at is a plan view plot of one depth layer out of our three-dimensional grid. In each grid block, we've plotted a stereo net here. And the stresses are shown as dots. So S1 is the red dot, S2 is the purple dot, and S3 is the yellow dot. And then the hypocenters are plotted in, in black just to kind of show where the earthquakes are clustering. So the, the overwhelming result to be taken from this data set is that the stress state is, is a normal strike slip stress state. And that's one where SV and SH max are approximately equal in magnitude. Okay, so this is a transtensional, um, extensional tectonic uh, environment. And what we notice here on this slide, which is um, from about negative 2.6, negative 1.2 kilometers, this is roughly corresponds to the, the reservoir interval. We notice that there's slightly more strike slip faulting um, where S, S1 is horizontal than there is in the north, where S1 has more of a tendency to be vertical, although we do have some, some mixed here where, where S1 is horizontal you know, and vertical. Um, so just to, to go back and, and kind of look at the tectonic setting of the geysers, okay, what you're looking at is from that original, the, the first map that we looked at, um, we've zoomed in on the area around the geysers and just showing some of the faults in the region. Here's the San Andreas out here by the coast. This fault right here is the Makama fault zone. This is the Green Valley fault zone over here. The field is bounded by the Mercuryville and Koliami faults, and these are all right lateral strike slip faults. So th there has been some suggestion that the geysers is a pull apart, is in a pull apart region. We're, we're not looking to address that, but it is important to, to know the tectonic setting. And we consider the, uh, the stresses and the fault plane orientations that we obtain. So now what you're looking at is a stress result from three uh, depth layers in our grid. So we're increasing with depth to the right. So this is the one that corresponds to the reservoir interval. And these two are down below the reservoir in the basement. And what we notice is that the faulting regime is no uh, normal strike slip, normal strike slip, normal strike slip. We don't notice any significant noteworthy changes with depth. Um, so. Uh, what we wanted to do um, in moving from a stress inversion to trying to figure out what the, the fracture orientation might be is choosing which of the two nodal planes from the focal mechanism inversion is the most likely plane to have slipped in the stress field that we obtain. So um, I, I'm not going to go into detail into this method. I just want to emphasize that uh, what we used, the criteria we used, was the ratio of shear to normal components on the plane. So we picked... The, which uh, we picked one of the nodal planes, the one that had the highest ratio of shear to normal um, resolved tractions. And using that method, these are the results that we obtained. So again, we're looking at the, the depth interval that corresponds to the reservoir. What you see plotted, we have our stereo nets here, the hypocenters, and the stresses. But you can also see very faintly some fault planes here plotted on the stereo net. Um, so you can see a, a northwest, or sorry, a northeast orientation of these fault planes. And actually, it might be a little easier to look over here at the rose diagrams. Um, so this basically, what we've plotted is a rose diagram for every grid block instead of showing the, the fault planes on a stereo net. So you can see what the orientation of the fault planes are here. 
again, uh, northeast southwest orientation. Sometimes you get a, an east west, a more east west orientation, and that's consistent with that strike slip tendency that we observed in the south, um, for instance. And then other times we have the, the more northeast orientation that's more suggestive of, of normal faulting. Um, so, again, with the, uh, the fracture orientation, we didn't notice any significant um, changes with depth. Uh, pretty consistent northeast-southwest fracture orientation. Um, so the question is, are these northeast, southwest, to east-west trending faults controlling flow in the basement and in the reservoir? And according to the critically stressed fault hypothesis, these are the faults that are slipping. So these are the ones most likely to be contributing to flow. So the conclusions are the faulting regime in the geysers is one of normal faulting and stripe, strike slip faulting from the reservoir down into the basement at about five kilometers depth. There is a slight tendency towards um, strike slip faulting in the south in the reservoir interval. Um, while the coast ranges are characterized by strike slip and reverse faulting, the geysers is tectonically unique, exhibiting uh, extensional tectonics, north, uh, sorry, normal faulting and strike slip faulting. Um, we've obtained a consistent SH max orientation of about north 23 east for the entire 3D volume, and this is consistent with other results obtained in the surrounding region in the coast ranges. Um, the orientation of the, the fault planes that we obtained, the northeast and east west orientations, um, indicate a strong preference for flow in these directions within and below the reservoir where most of the seismicity is occurring. So I'd like to thank Ernie Major from LBNL and also um, the Calpine folks are great, Mark Walters, Melinda Wright, and Craig Hartline. And this, uh, this work is funded by the Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions Sorry. right now. It's okay. Uh, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Haijang Zhang, who's going to be talking about a comprehensive seismic characterization of the Cove Fort Sulphurdale geothermal site in Utah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Haijang Zhang. Uh, next, I will go to uh, talk about using uh, different seismic methods to characterize the Kofort Sulphur Geothermal Site uh, in Utah. Uh, this site uh, is located uh, in the central Utah. Uh, geologically, it's located uh, in the transition zone between the basin range to the west and uh, the Colorado Plateau to the uh, east. The purpose of this project is to determine the size, shape, depth, and the properties of this uh, geothermal uh, body. We know uh, if there is a geothermal anomaly body uh, 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 in the Earth, uh, Geophysically, we can use uh, different geophysical properties to uh, characterize it. For example, I can use uh, temperature and heat flow and uh, sending velocity, density, and attenuation, and resistivities. And for example, uh, we know uh, for the seismic velocity, if uh, there is a temperature increase, and uh, we can see the velocity will uh, decrease at the different uh, pressures. Uh, for this project, first we, uh, uh, we uh, determine the large-scale seismic velocity model of uh, the whole uh, Utah area. So uh, first we collected all the uh, waveforms and P-wave route times uh, around the uh, Utah area, and we applied the double difference seismic tomography method to image uh, the velocity model of this area. And for this model, uh, the Spatial scale is about uh, 0.2 degrees, so it's about like 20 kilometers in the horizontal directions. And in the depth, it's from three to six kilometers. This is uh, uh, VP models at the different uh, depths, uh, starting from depth three kilometers, six kilometers, and 12 kilometers. So on the blue color, uh, 
means the higher velocity, and the red color means the lower velocity. And the white triangle uh, is the place of cold fault. So we can see starting from depths of three kilometers, we see uh, there's a low velocity anomaly uh, underneath the cold fault area. And uh, going down to the depths of 18 kilometers and 24 kilometers, this low velocity anomaly is uh, very strong. So basically from the seismic uh, uh, Tomography uh, uh, study, we see that uh, underneath the cold fold area, there's a velocity anomaly extending deep. And if we uh, relate this low velocity anomaly to the uh, high temperature anomaly, so uh, we can uh, actually uh, convert the uh, velocity anomaly to the temperature anomaly. So uh, basically, you can see around the cold fold area, there's uh, uh, like uh, on average uh, 100. Uh, degrees higher temperature uh, in this region uh, than the surrounding area. And this slide shows a cross-section of the VP model. And we can see uh, clearly there is a, a low velocity anomaly uh, beneath the cold fold area. And uh, however, because uh, uh, for this study we use uh, um, 12 times around the whole state, so basically we don't have much resolution at the shallow depths, so we could not uh, 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 get the uh, fine scale model around the shallow depths, like uh, from zero to uh, five kilometer. So in order to uh, uh, characterize the fine scale uh, model around the cold fold area, uh, in 2010 we installed uh, 10 seismic stations uh, around the, this area, Probably it's hard to see from behind. These triangles are seismic stations, and the blue dots are the earthquakes we collected uh, from 2010 to 2011. So uh, with this uh, set of earthquake data we collected, we uh, did a, 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 a series of studies. For example, we use a full fluid form invariant to determine focal mechanism of these earthquakes. And we uh, uh, used uh, the shear wave speeding analysis to, uh, to determine the uh, anastropy in this area. We also uh, applied the double difference seismic tomography to determine VP and VS models and the QP models, attention models, and also the uh, anastropy percentage models using the shear wave splitting uh, tomography method. So next I'm going to present uh, uh, the results using the uh, local earthquake data we uh, collected. So first is a uh, full waveform invariant uh, uh, using uh, to determine the focal mechanisms. And from the previous talk, we know that uh, once you determine the focal mechanisms, you can determine the stress regime of this area. So uh, here I just show the uh, uh, focal mechanisms for the four squeaks. We can see uh, 12 of them are the normal folding, and normal folding, and 12 of them are the strike sleep. And this is a uh, waveform feeding uh, we got. So this is for P, this is for S, and for P, uh, the feeding is uh, pretty good. So from the focal mechanisms we determined, we can uh, say that uh, in this area, the SH max is uh, uh, pointing to the uh, north northeast, and we also can see the fault plane kind of pointing to the north northeast. So this is the result we got. Uh, from the uh, focal magnitude uh, determination. And another method is to use uh, uh, is a uh, shear wave splitting analysis. So we know in the crust, uh, uh, generally there are two uh, uh, mechanisms. One is the stress induced uh, anastropy. Uh, this means that uh, for the fractures, they will mainly align in the direction along the SHMX and another. Uh, mechanism for the cross anastropy is uh, the structure controlled anastropy. So basically, for example, along the, uh, around the fold area, the, uh, uh, there will be uh, strong anastropy along the uh, fold plane. And we can use the shear wave splitting to analyze the anastropy, meaning that uh, for sh uh, shear waves, if it enters into the uh, anastropy, it will be uh, split into faster and slow shear waves. And we can use the delay times to characterize how strong the anastropy is, and we can also use the uh, polarization, polarization angles to determine along which direction the shear waves travel faster. So this slide, uh, 
This plot shows the average polarization direction of fast shear waves. So we can see uh, on these like uh, nine stations, the uh, fast uh, uh, directions is um, uh, directing north northeast, meaning that uh, the fractures are along this direction. And this is the average delay times for event uh, uh, depths. And we can see basically there's no trend of increasing of delay times along the increase of depths, meaning that uh, the anisotropy is mainly focused around the shallow area. By comparison to the local geology, we can see uh, this is, there's some faults. The, uh, in this area, the faults mainly align the north-northeast direction. So uh, this is quite consistent with the shear wave speeding analysis and also with the focal mechanism study. So next, I uh, present to you the VP and the VS models uh, using the local uh, earthquake data. So, uh, for this area, the uh, average uh, elevation is about uh, uh, two kilometers. So Z is, uh, 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 is uh, Z equal to zero is basically the mean sea level. So uh, this equal to minus one is basically uh, the depth lies uh, one kilometer below the surface. So we can see uh, in, the, in the middle area, there's uh, like a higher velocity uh, anomaly, and this is low velocity anomaly. So this low velocity anomaly are mainly due to the uh, sedimentary, and this high velocity anomaly are mainly due to the uh, modernite cores. And so this is a checkerboard pattern to show how well the model is uh, reserved. So let's go to another uh, depth. Uh, so the, the same, actually on the same depth, we also obtained the attention model, and uh, this is uh, and the stripping model. So you can see, for example, for this area, uh, we see a higher velocity anomaly, but uh, from the attenuation model, we see like a, a higher attenuation and also higher uh, anisotropy, indicating that uh, uh, for these areas, uh, uh, there are a lot of fractures, and so uh, that can cause uh, high attenuation and uh, uh, high anisotropy. So this is a uh, uh, vaccine model at a depth of 0.5 kilometer. This is a tiny model, and this is an anisotropy model. So we can see at a deeper depths, the anisotropy becomes uh, smaller around this area. Uh, however, there is a strong anisotropy in this region. And overall, for the anisotropy model, we see higher uh, attenuation to the west and a lower anisotropy to uh, lower attenuation to the uh, east. So this is a depth slice for the uh, two kilometer. And uh, uh, we can see uh, from the uh, models at one kilometer depth, we see that, uh, uh, for example, for this area, there is like a high velocity, and we see in this area is associated with uh, higher attenuation and uh, higher uh, anthropy, uh, indicating that this area may be, uh, 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 there may be a lot of fractures developed. Actually, uh, this plot shows the locations of the wells uh, they plan to uh, they plan to uh, uh, to uh, drill. So uh, actually, uh, I think they made a, a good choice because in this area uh, there should be a lot of fractures uh, involved. So uh, in conclusion, so we have uh, used. Uh, I mean, we have deployed a 10 station network to monitor uh, the uh, natural seismicity in a geothermal, uh, in, in this geothermal site. And we applied the focal mechanism analysis and the shear wave splitting to determine the uh, local stress regime and determine the fracture orientations. And we also use the seismic velocity and attenuation tomography to determine the velocity and attenuation models. So uh, this information can be used to identify the best target uh, for drilling. Thanks. Do we have any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay.
Our next presentation is by Will Pettit, Towards the Design of Effective Engineered Geothermal Systems. Give me just one second. Are you advancing the slides? Or am I advancing the slides? Are you advancing the slides or am I? What more than else isn't working. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, my, as Tim said, um, my name's Will Pettit. Um, I'm the, the general manager of ITASCA in, in Minneapolis. I have a geophysics background, so I normally end up speaking about uh, geophysics at engineering conferences. Uh, now I have the opportunity to talk about engineering at a, at a geophysics conference. So um, it's an interesting chain of, turn of events. Um, I'd like to start by, uh, by thanking my co-authors, in particular uh, Branko and Azadeh that's done most of the, uh, that have done most of the uh, modeling work in this, in this project. So what I'm going to give, show you is a, um, a brief summary of a, a project we're involved in with Sandia National Laboratories, um, looking at how we can bring engineering design to, uh, uh, to EGS systems. So this is a, a typical conceptual view of an EGS um, from uh, Jeff Tester's report, MIT report, uh, back in 2006. Um, we have a, 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 this is a doublet, so we've got two wells. We've got an injection well um, and a production well. Um, now the key, key thing with this, uh, these reservoirs is, uh, is the underground heat exchange that we have in the rock volume uh, within, the, within the reservoir. Uh, we have to make that uh, heat exchanger just right. It has to be uh, just uh, efficient enough to flow through, its, uh, flow through its flue so that we can get production. Um, and we can't uh, flow through fluids through at uh, too much of a great rate so that, uh, uh, because else they won't heat up. Uh, we also have thermal drawdown, so we have to balance that whole system uh, it's just right to make, it, uh, to make it produce over a long lifetime. We also have environmental considerations, such as seismicity. We need to make sure that um, we don't generate too high a magnitude seismicity. We have uh, disturbance of aquifers and, and that kind of thing going on. And then we also have economic risk. We have to make sure that this um, geothermal reservoir is, uh, um, produces econo economically to make it viable over the long term. Um, Doug Hollett, uh, who's the, uh, the geothermal program manager at uh, uh, DOE, uh, gave a presentation um, at the, the GRC conference back in October. Uh, and this was one of his slides he gave where he really challenged us to, uh, uh, to come up with uh, better engineering solutions for EGS. Um, can we produce new well uh, geometries uh, using latest technologies from the um, kind of petroleum world? Um, can we create reservoirs using uh, maybe multi-stage um, hydraulic stimulations like we do in, uh, in tight gas formations? Um, can we come up with uh, efficient uh, production uh, rates for the long term um, it, through these stimulations? Can we make this whole thing sustainable? So he really challenged us to, to come up with some engineering solutions for how we, uh, how we develop these EGS reservoirs effectively. So as I say, we're in a, a project with Sandia National Laboratory uh, to assist there in efforts, efforts in understanding how we can come up with engineered geothermal design and looking at the long-term viability of an EGS. Um, we're going to do this through performing large suites of numerical analyses to examine the critical issues uh, related to the development of EGS and the conditions necessary for its operation. And we're going to use those suites of numerical models uh, to provide sensitivity studies so that um, these key parameters can be used in, in future design decisions. So objectives. The project is really split up into two parts. The first part is to define the characteristics that uh, go into a, uh, a long-term viable EGS site. We begin using relatively simple models and then add complexity. 
We're going to use well-known validated um, software in two dimensions and three dimensions. This software is used um, around the world by various uh, different users um, in industry and, and academia and describes the physics and mechanics of rock very well. We're going to express this viability in terms of well flow rates and, and sustainable power production. Basically so that we can engage the, the geothermal industry and the power industry in this process. Part two of the project is to come up with these characteristics that we have from part one. Make an assessment, assessment of whether EGS is viable under realistic field conditions. First of all, do these conditions exist anywhere within a rock mass? Um, and then it, can we take those conditions and actually engineer solutions um, that, that, that can create EGS at particular sites? And this engineering will obviously use hydraulic stimulation methodologies of some sort. So the first, I'm going to basically give you a summary of some of the, the initial studies that we've done in this project. Um, the first thing is the sensitivity of the discrete fracture network. We know that D, the DFN is a, is a major player in the efficiency of uh, EGS. Um, heat production, optimized heat production, we need to enhance perme permeability of the fracture network. And this is usually done through hydro shearing and hydraulic fracturing. We need uh, to stimulate connectivity over a large volume of rock so that we get, get the heat pulled out of this rock mass um, effectively. So to do this, we need to better understand the interaction between the fluid injection and the characteristics of the discrete fracture network, including its density, lengths, orientations, etc. And I'm going to give you a, a few examples, three examples of, of, of results from this study. On the right here, we have a... a um, a representative DFN of a rock mass in two dimensions. This is two kilometer block. There's 3,000 fractures in here of various lengths. One of the interesting things with these DFNs, this is, this is colored um, associated with clustering of fractures. So all of these fractures that are one particular color are connected in some way. Um, so you, you don't just have a, a kind of a connection through a DFN um, that's homogeneous, you have a very heterogeneous um, connection through this rock mass, and that needs to be thought about within these designs. So we've done an initial study in, the, in two dimensions using uh, UDEC. Um, again, as I say, I'm going to give you some examples of that. And in UDEC, we can shear these fractures, we can uh, get delatency, um, permanent opening of the fractures, and we can extend fractures, um, and the whole thing is fully hydromechanically coupled. So in this first example, uh, we show uh, fracture length, um, uh, efficient, uh, hydro shearing efficiency with fracture length. Um, in the top one, we have a, a fracture set that um, has a, a, a maximum uh, fracture length that's just smaller than the, the area that we're looking at here. Um, so it's kind of a tight um, distribution of fracture lengths. In the bottom example, we have a much broader distribution of fracture lengths. Um, and there's long fractures that are um, actually cutting through this, through this volume. So you can see we, what, we, what we do here is we stimulate from the center here. As we stimulate, we um, um, exercise a, a larger uh, volume of fractures in this top one than the bottom one. And that's really because in this bottom one, what we're doing is we're connecting um, hydraulically into one of these long fractures. So we're producing a very um, isolated, uh, localized um, hydro shearing of this, of this volume uh, along that one main fracture that we've intersected. Whereas in the top, we intersect a larger area of fractures and create a larger um, uh, hydraulic, fracture, hydraulic stimulation. In this example, we show um, the relationship of orientation with hydro shear, for hydro shearing. Um, orientation with respect to the uh, maximum and minimum horizontal principle stresses. Um, in this top example, we have, uh, again, two conjugate fracture sets, but the second fracture set is orientated at a high angle to, to, to sigma max. In the uh, uh, lower example, the uh, second fracture set is, is uh, orientated at a much acuter um, uh, or, uh, angle to sigma max. So in the top example, what we're doing is we have only one fracture set that is um, orientated efficiently for, for hydro shearing, so we just, we just stimulate these fractures, the, these on-echelon fractures that are orientated in this direction. 
In the bottom example, we have both fracture sets that are orientated favorably for slips, so we generate a much area, much better connected area of, uh, of uh, hydro shearing. In this third example, we look at injection rate. On the left-hand side, um, we're injecting at a much high, uh, lower rate than on the right-hand side. And what this lower rate means is that we get uh, fluids dissipated further into the rock mass, so we're stimulating over a much larger area, but we don't stimulate as well. Um, the hydro shearing does not occur um, uh, as efficiently as when we, uh, when we inject at a higher rate. In a higher rate, we, we don't stimulate such a large area, but we, um, but we stimulate those fractures much better. So there's obviously a balancing act going on here between all these different parameters that go into producing, a, into producing an EGS. And I've given you kind of a, a bit of a, a brief summary of those, those kind of uh, what we're doing in, in, in getting some engineering design into this thing. So what are our next steps? Well, first of all, we need to bring the thermal component in. Um, all of these models can, can treat um, temperature and heat. So we're uh, looking at the heat production coming out of these DFNs so that we can compare that so that we can relate that to, to realistic uh, field uh, production and look at the sustainability of production. Uh, we're going to three dimensions. Uh, we need to look at the DFN behavior in three dimensions um, and, and investigate how we can really sequence these uh, EGS um, reservoir development um, through time. And then we're going to simulate different field uh, uh, demonstration cases and look at pressure histories um, validate our numerical models with microseismic results and pressure histories from the field. And I just want to dwell on that last one a little bit further because um, all of these numerical models can produce simulated microseismics. And as you know, microseismics is, uh, is a big tool for, uh, for EGS uh, field demonstrations and, and, and hopefully production in the future. What I've shown here are two examples um, of a three-dimensional numerical model that we've done for the petroleum industry. Um, both examples have the same DFN, um, again, conjugate fracture sets. In this case, they're orientated semi-parallel to uh, sigma-1. On the right-hand side, sigma-1 is rotated by 60 degrees, uh, sorry, 90, 60 degrees, um, so that the, the sigma-1 is, is at a higher angle to these, to these conjugate fracture sets. What you see happens is the, the color on these fractures, red is, is high pore pressure, blue is uh, low pore pressure. What you can see is we stimulate high pore pressures over a much larger area of these fractures when it's, they're orientated parallel to semi-parallel to sigma one. Um, and what we do is we get large amounts of tensile, both tensile and shear events, occurring on these, these fractures in our model. When you uh, kind of reorientate sigma one, so it's at a higher angle to these conjugate fracture sets, you still get tensile events occurring um, orientated uh, parallel to sigma one, um, but the, uh, you also get many, many more off-axis uh, off shear events going on. Um, so there's a large difference in, in behavior here between the two different, uh, two different uh, systems. And this can be related, what we can do is we can go to the field and we can get microseismic results and relate this to the, to the numerical models. So to conclude, um, engineering of geothermal reservoirs, we need to pay attention to the fracture network in particular. That's our initial, initial results. Uh, shear stimulation depends on many in situ um, factors. Um, the orientation and magnitude of the shear, stre shear stresses, fracture network geometry, all of this needs to be well characterized um, in a field for reliable design. So in other words, we need field measurements. If, condi if conditions are favorable, then increased um, hydro shearing is possible. Um, we can design this hydro shearing uh, effectively um, using optimized volumes, rates, and pressures. And then we can use microseismic field data along with other, other observations to validate these numerical models and provide feedback to uh, later stimulations. This process we're calling fracture network engineering. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Yes. Um, 
in all of these models, we can vary, uh, vary stresses completely independently of one another. So yes, they're, they're already, uh, they're already uh, anisotropic in, in sense. Um, in UDEC and 3DEC, it's, uh, it's uh, block, essentially a blocking material. So what we do is we put, uh, we put joints in the, in the model at the start, and then the, um, the, the hydraulic uh, kind of stimulation can go through those joints. Um, they're pre-existing, but uh, what we do is we have, we have different uh, numerical modeling approaches. Um, so we have, uh, for instance, PFC, and uh, um, hydro, hydro fracture stim simulator that we've got um, that uh, is completely, that the fractures can just grow however they want to. They're completely emergent from the, from the behavior. But they're not for a larger scale. Yeah, we can run those in at, at reservoir scale now as well. Yeah. Our next speaker is Don Vasco. Uh, he'll be presenting monitoring deformation at the Geysers Geothermal Field in California using C-band and X-band interferometric synthetic aperture radar. Okay, I want to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, they're fairly numerous, but uh, mainly it's a co collaboration between uh, Berkeley Laboratory and uh, TRE, which is a process processing NSAR data from Milan, Italy, and then the Calpine Corporation. Okay, the objectives of this work are to explore the use of uh, NSAR data, interferometric synthetic aperture radar data at the geysers. Um, and one particular application is to uh, monitor surface deformation associated with uh, enhanced geothermal systems. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to give an uh, overview of NSAR monitoring at the geysers that we've done. And then I'm going to talk about the results from uh, the enhanced geo geothermal systems project that we looked at. And then I'll end with the conclusions. Okay, uh, typically um, the surface of the Earth will deform, and um, you'll get a three-dimensional displacement vector. Uh, what we do with NSAR monitoring is um, it's a satellite-borne technique, space-borne technique, that in which a microwave or radar wave um, is ref uh, sent down to the Earth and reflected or backscattered back. Um, and the uh, waveforms are recorded, and the, the phase change in the reflected uh, wave from two pa a few passes will give you a, a, a phase shift, which can be converted to a range change or a change in the line of sight distance, which is that yellow uh, arrow. Um, so you're basically projecting the uh, displacement vector onto a line of sight vector. Okay, if you have multiple components, which we do for some of the later constellations of satellites, the X-band data that I'll talk about, you can actually get multiple components by uh, using multiple satellite geometries. And then you can use those to get a quasi-east-west and a quasi-vertical, for example. Okay, I apologize for this uh, figure. I realized last night there's no scale on it, but this is the C-band results, uh, which are some uh, earlier NSAR data. So this is a range change and um, See, where's the pointer? Okay, so the geysers is uh, this dark line curve here that encompasses the geysers field. And this is about 30,000 uh, scatterers f obtained from C-band data. And this is range change, which is, di again, distance, change in distance to a reference point in space or a satellite in space. And this, uh, the entire scale here goes from... Uh, minus 200 millimeters or 20 centimeters to uh, 200 millimeters. So this is, in the geysers you can see a, a increase, increase in range due to the subsidence of the earth. So you see a 
the, the peak subsidence here is 20, 20 centimeters. And um, so you can see within the geysers itself, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, subsidence. And this is over the time period 1992 to 1999. So it's a seven year period. Um, and then the, the rest of the region around the geysers, there's not much change. This is essentially zero. Okay, if we look at, uh, for example, uh, an average of the points in the middle of the geysers, you can see um, the range uh, change, and it's positive downward now, so this is increasing range change, um, and it's in millimeters. So again, this is a change in distance to the satellite, so you can think of this as a proxy for subsidence in a lot of cases. So this is from 1995 to 2000, or actually 1999. So you can see the subsidence associated with the production of the geysers. Uh, which is rough, roughly a few, mil, a few centimeters per year. And you can see um, the, the temporal spacing or the sampling that we have in time um, from the spacing of the, these dots here, these uh, boxes. So you can see we have a, a few months sampling. In some cases, we have big gaps of six months or so. Um, you can notice on top, superimposed on the uh, overall subsidence is uh, our other signals, variations, like almost periodic. And you can relate those to seasonal effects and, uh, oh, sorry, how do I go back? Um, and changes in injection and production history. So this is uh, for the same time period, 95 to 2000. This is uh, millions of kilograms injected as a function, so as a function of time. You can see the periodicity. Depending on the uh, season and the need for uh, power at the geysers, they throttle back injection and production. So. Uh, in, in a different fashion. So production changes in one way, one manner, and injection changes in another. So we can see this in the surface deformation. Okay, um, so early on we had the NVSAT data set, which is, and then after that, the NVSAT data satellite was decommissioned at the, in the, around 2009. Oops. Those are my pointer. Oh, never mind. Okay, and after that, we, we acquired other satellites, which are shown below in the blue. Okay. Um, so there were, uh, after the decommission of the NVSAT data uh, satellite, we acquired that there were the uh, Cosmos SkyMan, which is an Italian satellite, and then the uh, Terrasar X, which is a, a constellation of satellites operated by Germany. So we could use these data. Um, after we used the C-band data. And the advantages of X-band data, it's a higher spatial resolution. So the C-band data, um, if you had a pixel on the surface of the Earth, so you're sampling a region of the surface of the Earth, it's tens of meters by tens of meters. So uh, the spatial resolution for uh, the X-band is of the order of one to five meters. Uh, furthermore, rather than a monthly revisit time or about 35-day revisit time for the C-band data, we have a weekly, almost a weekly revisit time for the X-band. So we have a higher temporal sampling and a higher spatial sampling. Um, so just to compare the two data sets, they don't overlap in time, but they do overlap in space. We can uh, look at the same area. And I'm going to look at this region in the rectangle here. It's in the northwest geysers, and I'm going to compare the uh, X-band and C-band uh, data coverage for that region. And that's shown here. On the left is the uh, C-band coverage. And on the right is the X-band coverage. Uh, again, the time periods are different. Um, the C-band was, as I said, 1992 to, to 99. Um, so this is longitude and latitude. And then these uh, pixels denote the coverage for the C-band data. There's about a, a little more than 1,000 uh, pixels here, or elements. And the X-band data has over 100,000. So you can see there's much denser coverage um, from the X-band data. Uh, so we, had to refer we referenced uh, the uh, X-band data to uh, a point near our in injection site over here. Um, so the reference point was a little different, but we tried to re-reference the C-band data to get a similar reference. And you, um, the uh, subsidence is roughly the same order of magnitude. It's about 40. Uh, four centimeters of subsidence in that region over there. So we get a much denser coverage with the uh, X-band. 
So now let's look at, uh, use the X-band data to look at this enhanced geothermal project. And that's just this little rectangle here. There's, a, there's two wells, uh, a production and an injection, an injection and production well. So we're going to focus in on this little region here and look at the uh, cells. Are. So, that, so the, for an enhanced geothermal uh, setup, we have an injection well, which is this blue line here. And in the injection well, you inject cool water. And this is the high temperature geothermal reservoir in the geysers. Um, that water heats up and is converted to steam. And then there's a production well nearby, which extracts the steam. So this, that's the basic idea. And um, this was done in the Northwest geysers. And this is just showing, um, this is time in days, about 110 days. And then this is uh, injection rate in the injection well that we used. And then this is the, uh, the pressure change in a nearby pr production well that was pre-production. So we actually could measure the pressure before they started withdrawing fluid. Um, so early on, there was just uh, it was essentially an observation well. So you can see when they, they had a quite high injection rate initially, over 1,000 gallons per minute. And then that was to get the air bubble or essentially to saturate the region around the well. And then they brought it back down to about 400 gallons per minute for a few months. And then they jacked the rate up again to near 1,000 gallons per minute. And you can see how in the uh, production well, you can see the pressure responses uh, due to those rate changes. So let's see um, what happens to the deformation at the surface. So this is deformation or range change um, on the left here. This is a, a map, so it's longitude and latitude. And each of these uh, rectangles signifies a range change. And this is a scale uh, value here. This is five millimeters of range change, or half a centimeter of range change. So everything's scaled to that. So, um, so this is, Prodi 32 is actually the injection well. And this is the production well, which is, uh, during this time interval, is an observation well. So they injected fluid in this well, mainly down here. Um, and they. We recorded uh, NSAR data every eight days, essentially. And this is, after 175 days, this is the uh, surface range change. So you can see, between the injection and production well, you can see a, a decrease in range change, which is due to uplift. And then this is, overall, in the whole region, there's an increase in range change due to this, uh, general regional subsidence. So if we look at a point here, um, this circle, it's a, a scatter that we're looking at. We look at the time series. So this is at the start of inject, injection is this vertical line, and then the increase in uh, injection rate to 1,000 gallons per minute is this other vertical line. So you can see prior to injection, we, we don't have much range change uh, scatter. And then after the start of injection, we get, uh, this is range decrease. We get uh, increase in range, uh, a range decrease, basically. Um, Okay, there's also, uh, they monitored seismicity at the same time, and, and this is just seismicity essentially around the same period um, after the start of injection. And you could take the site, oops. Go back. Here, I'll do it. I don't want to overshoot. So, so this is a, earthquake density plot, essentially. So uh, the darker colors are higher density earthquakes. And this is uh, per 100, 100 meter by 100 meter square. So there's a 100 earthquakes per 100, 100 by 100 meter square. So you can see the high density of earthquakes um, associated with the injection uh, corresponds pretty well to where we get a, a range change, a significant range change. So we could try to correlate the uh, NSAR deformation and uh, seismicity, for example, and fluid flow data. So in conclusion, then, uh, the C-band and X-band NSAR can be used successfully at the geysers. And the X-band seems particularly promising. In particular, it, uh, we get improved temporal and spatial resolution. Um, the X-band data can resolve the uh, roughly one to centimeter level uplift associated with the uh, deformation due to the EGS injection. Um, so we're going to continue work on this project. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, John, how about to, 
when, when you acquire the NSAR data, it's a number of inversion now. And it, is there like a precision related? Can yeah, there's a. Repeat the question. He was saying that when you actually process the NSAR data, that's equivalent to an inversion um, to get the range changes. And that's true. There is a, a fairly significant amount of processing involved in the extracting the range change estimates. The precision is a, a millimeter or so, or essentially uh, a few millimeters. Uh, that, that's the best estimate. A lot of the uh, noise is due to an uh, atmospheric signal, and uh, that's why it's really good to have a time series where you can try to extract the atmosphere and uh, reduce the noise, that noise. Um, there's also, at the geysers, there's a lot of sources of, uh, I don't know if you want to call it signal generated noise, but there's a lot of landslides and uh, other features, uh, vegetation and things that can cause sources of noise as well. Uh, So the question was, is there a prediction when the, the uh, subsidence will level off for the whole field? Whatever you took that. Yeah, for the, for the uh, EGS project, they actually stopped pumping. So we're going to monitor the, you know, the, the range change associated with the stopping pumping and the, hopefully the recovery. So uh, as far as the full field, um, uh, yeah, I don't know when it will. That's a geomechanical question. I'm not sure when. That'll level off if ever. Any other questions? Thank you. We'll move on to our next presentation. Um, it's by Kim Patton, oh, Lee Allison, excuse me. And the, the presentation title is National Geothermal Data System State Geological Survey Contributions to Date. Okay, so do I, okay, do I launch this? How do we get that up? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Um, I want to talk about the national geothermal data system that's being built across the country, and in particular, the work we're doing in the Arizona survey in bringing in data from all of the 50 state geological surveys. So the team here is our team at Arizona, but as you'll see, there's a, a dozen or more organizations around the country that are heavily involved in this. So the idea is that with support from the U.S. Department of Energy, we're building an online framework for a distributed national data system and digital data aimed at fast and efficient data discovery, access, and analysis. And the concept is that the industry has worked with DOE over the past several years saying that their top priority is getting ready access to reliable data for geothermal discovery and development. DOE is funding it. We're using a data framework that's being built jointly between the U.S. Geological Survey and the state geological surveys through our AASG organization. We call this the U.S. Geoscience Information Network. Uh, DOE is funding five different projects across the country, and these are the prime contractors and, and the primary subs on those uh, building this system. The state geological surveys uh, uh, have all 50 of us involved in that, but you can see that there's a half a dozen of the major geothermal energy research centers, the USGS, and as well as a national lab at the National Renewable Energy Lab. Each node in this distributed network is digitizing data, archiving it, managing their own data, and providing that content independently into a distributed national system. It's all open source. We're developing standard protocols that are nationally and internationally recognized standards. It's a distributed framework, and the same way we have a catalog search interface among catalogs coming from all of the data providers. So it's a distributed catalog and distributed data network. This is a screenshot of the uh, uh, geothermaldata.org website. Everything I'm showing today is live, online. Anything I show you, you can get. We're running live demos at the exhibit hall uh, starting tomorrow morning at booth 104. So come by and we'll show you what's going on. 
It's in beta operational mode today. There will be a more sophisticated user interface developed over the next 12 to 15 months. We have huge amounts of data, not just geothermal data, but data relevant to geothermal exploration and uh, development. So there's a lot of energy data from oil and gas fields. There's a lot of water data. It's anything that we can use. What we're developing is compatible with standards and protocols, procedures in the oil industry, with the hydrology uh, quasi, with a number of federal agencies, the Western Regional Partnership, the USGS, National Science Foundation, and we've uh, plugged this into data.gov and big data, other national and international initiatives. And everything we're doing is scalable and transportable to a variety of other data sets. Uh, we've got over 30 different data types that are in the repositories coming out of the various uh, contributors right now. We're adding new data types. Uh, this is uh, just a screenshot of, uh, of what's up there right now. We have a vast amount of data online, over 1,000 data sets coming from all over the country. We've got over 2.5 million records, and it's growing weekly. And we're announcing today that last week we passed over a million and a quarter wells online free and downloadable. So uh, 840,000 oil and gas wells, 400,000 water wells, 9,000 geothermal, and our prediction is that that number will double or triple within the next year. So just a screenshot of our uh, one of the a real basic catalog search coming in here. Uh, there's a mashup of, of the U.S. bringing in uh, base maps from the Bureau of Land Management from their geocommunicator site in, in Denver. So we're feeding in land use, land management data sets along with geothermal. Here's a quick search in Nevada for aqueous geochemistry data. We went in and found what was available that the, the Nevada Bureau of Mines, the University of Nevada, is serving. Uh, brought that in, mashed it up with uh, various uh, land use layers. Uh, went and looked for California, brought in that data set. And so real simple tools. You can download this, work with it in your own software, work with it on the cloud. Uh, and there's some basic tools that we have online that you can work with as well. Uh, we can also search not only by keywords or data types, but here we just drew a bounding box and brought in all of the, uh, the wells, whether they're oil and gas or water wells, from four states in the mid-continent region, um, and hundreds of thousands of wells coming from, uh, here's Kansas, I'm sorry, Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, uh, and tennis, uh, Ohio, I believe, yes. So, again, uh, use different base maps. Here we're bringing up a Google Earth uh, base map. We brought up some well data, and uh, on the left here, we clicked on this one well. Here's some of the header information metadata, so you can query any of these data sets. And where we're moving now is integrating the different types of data. So, for instance, on this particular well coming, I believe this is up in the geysers area, uh, so you can bring in core data, well logs, uh, other analytical data, and they're all linked in an interoperable data network. We partnered with USGS back five years ago to start building this framework. Uh, we're moving it through on the state side through the uh, National Geothermal Data System. The USGS is developing it through their community on data integration and science base. Western Regional Partnership, 15 federal agencies, five governors, over 10,000 GIS layers for land use and land management. This is a node plugging into the system and providing all of that information. Energistics, the oil and gas industry, uh, it's their uh, uh, nonprofit standards organization, over 100 of the world's largest oil companies and national oil ministries. They're a partner with us, and we're developing common metadata standards. And in fact, the metadata standards uh, uh, are going through ISO approval, and I believe in about two weeks in uh, Saudi Arabia, they'll be doing the final approval of ISO 19115 for geospatial data, which will more, uh, more uh, formally uh, link the oil industry in so that they can use this data and also share this data with our network. Internationally, we've got a number of uh, collaborators and partners in various stages of development. Uh, I won't go into all of those, but within the U.S., uh, we're, we're tying everything into uh, national initiatives. Uh, GeoSOAR is uh, 60 organizations, national organizations throughout Latin America on a spatial data infrastructure using the same protocol standards, uh, presentation uh, methods that we are. We've got great partnerships over the last three years with a variety of projects in the European Union through the INSPIRE initiative. Uh, new National Hydrocarbon Commission just formed in Mexico. They're just getting started. They're very excited about using the same platform. 
uh, and then national data repositories. 30 different countries have national data repositories, and we've been talking about how we integrate their data systems with our data systems. Everyone's converging, moving uh, towards a similar platform, similar approach. So where we stand today, we've got a national network. It's operational. Um, it's open source. It's distributed. It can grow. We've got millions of oil and gas, uh, water wells, and millions of other data points uh, already online for free, using, for free use. Uh, it's compatible with systems being built in industry, in government, in academia, across the country, and across the world. We also think this is scalable and transportable, and we're seeing that with our partners. Uh, it's not just for geothermal data, but it's going to be a great tool for the geothermal industry. So we're hoping that we can deploy this and use it in other geoscience applications. So thanks to the Department of Energy for their vision, and thanks to all of our partners. Uh, we're very excited. We invite you to come by booth 104. Thanks. Are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> uh, we're, we're <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, and there's a lot of contributors. I see a lot of our co colleagues in the audience here who've been digitizing the data. And one thing I didn't mention is that not only are the data providers the ones on the screen there, but DOE is funding uh, with stimulus money over the last three years 130 projects to the tune of $325 million. The data from all of those projects are required to be included into the system. So the geothermal data repository at the National Renewable Energy Lab is taking any data from anybody who isn't going to serve it themselves as a node in the network, they will be an archive for that, as well as all of the existing DOE data for geothermal. So this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and so this is going to grow tremendously over the next uh, 18 months, pretty much. Anyone else? Thank you. OK, thanks. So we'll move on to our last presentation for the morning by Jude Mazuza, uh, the prediction of predominant convection in sedimentary basin systems. Good afternoon. I'm presenting to you a dimensionless number that can predict predominant um, thermal convection in thermohaline systems. These are systems where you have density gradients motivated by salinity and temperature gradients. The work is done together with my colleagues, Farini Radu and Sabine Attinger. Just a rough outline. I'll give you an introduction which has a motivation and some rough ideas about homogenization theory, but just what we need to derive our um, number. Then I'll present the results and uh, some closing remarks. This work is in the general framework of fingering instabilities in density driven systems. And since some years ago, some work has been done and some factors are known to retard the growth of fingers while others promote the same. And for example, viscosity is known to dissipate the energy and the, hinger, the, growth, of, um, the growth of fingers, while diffusion and dispersion cause mixing, and the flow velocity that is orthogonal to the direction of fingers, we transport them before they form and they grow, and the medium heterogeneity also causes mixing. On the other hand, 
if you have a flow velocity that is in the direction of the fingers, it will propagate them. While a medium heterogeneity can cause channeling effects, and if you have a denser fluid which is on top of a less denser one, or a cooler fluid which is on top of a warmer one, the system tends to overturn and develop fingers. Already, we derived an, um, a number that could predict the onset of fingers in hairline systems. And that is the difference between such and such. And if you're interested, we have the results in these three publications. The objective now is to include temperature effects and move from hairline to some hairline systems. And a typical application is a sedimentary basin where you have both temperature and salinity increasing with depth. And when you have such a setting, the fresh water which is on top here, we tend to be displaced by the warm um, fluid at the bottom. And that tendency to displace will uh, cause convection in the system. And we have two types of convections. We have that from the weight of the solute, which moves downwards. On the other hand, we also have heat transport to the top, which causes convection in the opposite direction. And we have a system that has two opposing convections. And what I'm going to present to you now is the number that can predict when the thermal convection is exceeding that from the solute. The setting that we use um, is a so-called thermohaline uh, salt dome problem. And we have a temperature, constant temperature and the mass fraction at the bottom, part of the bottom, also at the top. But the values at the bottom are higher than those at the top. And then the vertical boundaries uh, with the zero diffusive fluxes. The equations we use is the usual flow, solute transport, and the energy equation together with the DASI. And because of this dependence of the density on the mass fraction and temperature, the whole system is coupled. And so then, in addition to the boundary and initial conditions which are usually needed, you need to close the system with such equations of state. And for our case, we choose the linear for simplicity. So about homogenization, if you're going to do this, you need two scales. First, the small scale at which there is a lot of variability, and the large scale where you do the observations. And you need to de uh, define a parameter epsilon, which is the ratio between the two scales and you assume that to be very small, most going to zero. And when you do that, you have this high variability at the small scales, but if you look at the large scale, the system will look as if it, it changes very slowly, it's like it's smoothened out. And to the right is a picture where I plotted some sinus functions with um, a large scale 200 times the small scale. And if you look at the large scale, the function looks smooth almost, but there's a lot of variability at the small scales. So the steps, first you expand your quantity of interest in the two scales, and then you invoke this assumption that the epsilon is very, very small, and then you get what is called well-separate scales. Then you write the, the derivatives in the equations I showed you in terms of the two scales, and then you substitute these derivatives together with expansions in the transport equations, and you group the terms according to the powers of the epsilon. And you get three results. The first one is the so-called compatibility condition, which is the statement that the macroscopic quantities are independent of small scales. Then you get the, at the large scale, you get the macroscopic equations, which contain the homogenized tensors, and at the small scales, you get the so-called cell problems. In our case, the cell problems had this exponential decay form, and the temporal behavior of the solutions depend on the sign of this thing here, the capital lambda. If that lambda is positive, the system goes to, the solution goes to an asymptote, otherwise it grows unbounded. And if you have that unbounded growth at the small scales, it has to be transmitted at the, um, to the large scales unless 
you have a mechanism like a mixing that can smoothen it out. And the task then was to evaluate this thing. A lot of steps were done, but I don't show this. I just show you the result that you get finally. And this is the dimensionless number, which is in two parts. This first part, until the plus sign, is the contribution from the temperature, and that is from the salinity. And the important things here is this small gamma, which is the temperature coefficient, then the alpha, which is the density coefficient, and the beta, which is from the viscosity. For the salt dome problem that we study, the number takes this form, which is much simpler than the one I showed before. And in the next slide, I'll show you um, the simulations, results, and the computations that we get when we put certain values in this expression. So on the table, there are the parameters that we use for the simulations and the results now. First, we fix the salinity so as to get this uh, density and the value of the temperature, we increase it. And you can see the number in reduces from positive to negative and the temperature that gives a positive number gives two pairs of convection cells. The upper one, the blue, is due to the temperature and the lower one is due to the uh, salinity. And as the temperature increases, this pair is lost and you have the thermal cells uh, becoming stronger. The next slide, we fix the temperature and increase the salinity. And again, we compute the number. You see it is increasing from negative to positive. And the density that gives the negative number has these uh, thermal cells. And as soon as the number becomes positive, we have this green pair which is coming. And as the density increases, it increases in strength. Next, we attempted to mimic the intrusion of groundwater into the deeper aquifers, and we applied a velocity at the top of the domain. But this didn't work because we increased the velocity so much and the sign of the number was not changing. And that could be due to, to the coupling between the solute dispersion and the temperature transport. And we do not take such effects into consideration. But the good thing we learned here is that if you have very high velocities, you are able to transport the um, solute from the lower reaches towards the surface. Because groundwater is creeping, you do not expect to have so high velocities. So we stuck to the low velocities and drive a condition that would give no uh, thermal convection in the system. And as long as the density coefficient exceeds this thing here, then we predict that we should have no thermal conversion in the system. And so I chose some densities, computed the coefficient, computed the right-hand side, this F is this thing here, and then the difference between the two quantities. And we are predicting a change between 1,000 and 1,000.5 kilogram per cubic meter. And when you look at the simulations, this for 1,000, you, have, you still have these thermal convections. And when the sign switches to positive, the thermal convection is lost. But then you have this uh, solute convection coming in. Then we investigated the effect of medium heterogeneities. Because as I told you, once you have that unstable behavior at the small scales, it could be seen at the large scales, and then you have to change whether mixing could change the system and suppress the, the unstable behavior. And what we saw was that the symmetry is lost, and there is mixing. If you look at these contours, they, the vertical travel distance increases as you increase the heterogeneity. But then when you look at the cells, you have this uh, thermal convection all the way through. Yeah? So the heterogeneities can modify the, 
the, the, the evolution of the cells, but is not able to offset the balance between the solute and the thermal convection. And because of this, we did not compute the, the tensors that I showed you in that uh, schematic. But then we reckoned that probably fractures have a similar effect to that of heterogeneities, but we've not che checked this as yet. And some concluding remarks. We are able to derive a stability indicator for some high energy systems in terms of physical variables, and the indicator performed reasonably well. But unlike in saline systems where medium heterogeneities are important, here the important factors are only salinity and temperature. And that was it. Oh, sorry. What we are doing now, we are applying these results to real-life sedimentary basins in Germany. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions? Suha? Yeah, what, what kind of numerical scheme did you use to solve your equations numerically? Can you repeat uh, the question, too? He's asking about the numerical scheme that is used to solve the equations. It's a finite, uh, first centered finite volume scheme for the space. Then the time is implicit Euler. And you, you don't adapt the mesh to capture the. the it, 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 it does, um, it's adaptative, it does adapt itself. It follows the, 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 oh, the front. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it does that by itself. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, would you all help me uh, thank all of our speakers for today? And uh, remember, there's a poster session this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>